Okay, we're at 10 after. Um, so we know that folks are going to be trickling in over the next while, but wanted to formally welcome you all to JROS 2020. Um, this is the second JROS. The first one was in 2018 um, in, Heather, correct me if I'm wrong, I believe Berkeley, California, San Francisco Bay Area, California, around that general place. Um, and we are so excited to be back with you for this. Um, for those who are new to the J. Ross Conference, I know there's a lot of new faces. I personally was not at that first J. Ross, though my organization, Invest in Open Infrastructure, came out of J. Ross. Um, J. Ross started as a you know way to bring together various practitioners of open research, um, infrastructure providers, advocates, et cetera, to think through what a joint roadmap of open science tools and open research tools could look like. Um, really thinking through, you know, wh what are better ways that we can collaborate and work together? That spirit, I think, is really something that uh, per permeates the work of this broader community, especially when we talk about open infrastructure, open research, collaboration, and efficiencies we can gain by working together. Uh, my name is Caitlin Thaney. For those who uh, this might be the first time meeting me virtually through a screen, uh, I'm the executive director of Invest in Open Infrastructure, um, which is a nonprofit initiative dedicated to helping to further the resourcing and funding of open infrastructure and the open technology that research and scholarship rely on. Um, as I mentioned, um, Invest in Open Infrastructure came out of a what otherwise would be called, if we were together, a hallway conversation at JROS um, of individuals coming together and, you know, having a, a really robust discussion about the sustainability challenges, which I know many of us feel, especially this year, quite viscerally. Um, I joined Invest in Open Infrastructure this past March, coincidentally, right as the pandemic shut down the city that I'm based in. Um, and, you know, we've been working with many of you and others in the community to think about what are the ways in which we can, in this really um, special moment, but also this really tough moment where we're facing not only economic volatility, increased demand for access to materials and infrastructure that's under strain in various places, as well as other elements that are focused on, you know, the um, systemic inequities that exist in our systems when we talk about open source, higher education, funding, and um, other sort of resourcing challenges as well. So we are really excited. We've got a very, very full three days for you all, um, where we've got not only keynotes and panels, we'll be hearing from in, you know, industry and um, higher education leaders, um, those who are paving the way with their tools, technology, collaborations in various ways, really practical information from those who are um, working alongside and also have been, you know, piloting new interventions and new technologies, as well as from funders and from other community advocates. So we are very, very excited to have you all here. Um, I will be take a moment just to share my screen because I've got some housekeeping items I wanted to quickly go through. Give me one moment here. And let's go into presenting mode. Can everyone see my full screen? Okay, welcome, welcome, welcome again for those who are just joining us. Uh, and I wanted to start with a land acknowledgement, which I know that we're a virtual event. Um, I'm based here in Brooklyn, New York. Um, I wish to acknowledge that this conference, albeit virtual, um, is starting with where I am right now, um, situated upon the traditional ancestral and unceded land of the Munsi, Lenape, and Canarsie people. Um, we pay respect to the elders, both past and present, as well as future generations. This acknowledgement demonstrates our commitment to working to dismantle the systems of oppression that have displaced indigenous peoples and ongoing legacies of settler colonialism. Um, we strive to make this as inclusive as a space as possible. Uh, and we, we know that being a virtual event, we have representation for from so many different areas around the world. Um, Vanessa will be sharing a, a link so that if you are interested in seeing you know, what, uh, what sort of land you are operating off of, you can do so too. 
In terms of housekeeping, I know this is an interesting segue. So in terms of housekeeping, um, we ask that folks, um, if you uh, can make your Zoom name reflective of your first and last name, um, please feel free to also add your project affiliation. Um, and if you'd like your preferred pronouns, um, if you're new to Zoom and this is the first time that I know just in case, if you're new to Zoom and this is the first time that you're, um, you're looking to kind of change your name in the top right hand corner of your video box, um, there's a little, there's three, um, three dots. If you click on that and click rename, you should be able to amend that there. For Q&A, um, we are going to be monitoring um, the Zoom chat for you know, the video here, where we'll be doing live um, Q&A. So if you have a question for one of the speakers or for, uh, you know, for the lightning talks, it'll be a little, little tougher. We've got a dedicated channel for that. But for you know, the keynotes and the panels and the main stage sessions, please feel free to add your um, question there. Vanessa has created in Slack a um, JROS 2020 chatter channel. So if you want to share, you know, hellos or fun pet photos or something else, please direct that there. It, it helps us make it so that the questions that are surfaced, we can process um, a little bit easier. We also have a, a dedicated um, Slack channel, which all of you have been added to if you've joined that Slack um, for the JROS 2020 conference. That please feel free to add any questions there as well. We will be um, monitoring that chat for those questions and helping to make sure that those are represented. Um, but for the live Q&A, if you can keep it to the Zoom chat, that would be great. Um, just a quick note about the Slack, that JROS 2020 conference um, channel is also where we're gonna be sharing out the links to join tomorrow's set of panels and breakouts as well as Wednesdays. Um, given the, the size and the subscription that we've seen for, um, for this event, we wanted to just make sure that, you know, the, um, the Zoom chat stayed for registrants because uh, we know that there have been some challenges with having large audiences um, and wanted to make sure that this remains sort of a safe environment and inclusive environment for those who'd registered. Timekeeping, we've got a really tight schedule. Um, Vanessa, my colleague and also members of the program committee who I'll introduce in a moment, um, we will be sending reminders in the Zoom chat. We also ask that if you're leading a session um, or speaking to please you know, try to keep within the, the time constraints of that block. Um, we'll, we'll kind of gently nudge in that regard, but just to keep an eye out for that too. We've also set up a um, place for questions. So if you have questions around about JROST, um, feel free to hop on over to the help desk. Um, the help desk is staffed with uh, members of our program committee and also members of the community. If you feel like you wanna jump in and help answer a question, please feel free to. But um, we've got some dedicated folks there who'll be working to help answer those questions. Let's see. Um, also, we are committed to creating a safe and inclusive space for all attendees. Um, we, you know, are here to have really robust discussions. Not everybody agrees all the time. That's entirely okay. Um, we ask that everyone remain respectful and professional in that. And we have an event safety team, which is myself, um, my colleague, Vanessa Reinsmith from UCLA. Vanessa, if you want to wave. There you go. I don't know if we've got a lot of people on the video. Um, and also Danielle Robinson from Code for Science and Society, who many of you know too. Uh, you can reach us. The Code of Conduct channel uh, is the best way to reach us for that. Um, we've also linked to the Code of Conduct for this event. Um, but if you have any questions, please feel free to reach out to us um, or visit that channel to um, seek additional support. Additional notes. We are recording this meeting. It's automatically set up for today. <laughs> so um, meeting recordings, we are aiming to make those available through the IOI website. And we'll also send that, send a link out to that, uh, to the registrants and the speakers as well um, in, in January. Um, if you would rather not to be you know, recorded, please feel free to um, turn your video off. Um, we are also working to ensure that the breakout sessions are recorded tomorrow as well. Um, if there is something that you want to make sure is not, um, you know, included in those recordings, I would ask that you just, um, you know, note that to us as soon as you can, because um, we are trying to be as open and transparent about this as, as we as possible. Um, if you have questions, please feel free to flag those to the event organizers, uh, and we're happy to help. 
our program committee. Uh, JROS did not organize itself. Um, we have we are lucky to have the following folks uh, helping with us. Um, you know, in, in terms of helping to make this event possible. Um, just to quickly go through, uh, JROS program committee for this year includes Kristen Rattan from Stratos, Danielle Robinson from Code for Science and Society, Juan Pablo Elprin from Public Knowledge Project. Bianca Kramer from Utrecht University, Ian Ernestkiewicz, I hope I got that close, Ian from PLOS, um, Greg Tenenbaum from the Open Research Funders Group, Heather Staines is an independent consultant, Dan Whaley from Hypothesis, Joe MacArthur from Open Access Button and the Right to Research Coalition, Rain Crow from Spark, myself from Best and Open Infrastructure, uh, which is also, um, you know, the the organization that Jay Rost um, falls under as a community program, and also Vanessa Reinsmith from UCLA Center for Critical Internet Inquiry. Huge thanks again to the program committee. And lastly, I wanted to thank our event sponsors. Um, this year's event would not be made possible without the support from these organizations, uh, including the Chan Zuckerberg Initiative, Crossref, Hypothesis, and Ithaca. Um, thank you to each and every one of these organizations who have not only supported the organization of this year's event, but also the J. Rost Rapid Response Fund, um, which is going to support um, community members and, and projects in this critical time. So our thanks again. And with that, I'm going to stop sharing my screen. Go. There we go. Um, our um, event over the next three days um, has a really full uh, and exciting agenda. We've tried to bring together the various corners around um, not only open infrastructure, open research tools, uh, practitioners' perspectives, funders' perspectives, and more. Um, we hope that there's something here for, for everyone. We know that we've, um, the original event was, I believe, around 80 to 85 participants from um, a number of organizations. And so it's really wonderful to see the representation here too. Um, a note also about the schedule. Um, you'll notice that we have uh, two blocks each day from you know, in the Eastern time, 10 a.m. until 1 p.m. and then also 7 p.m. until 10 p.m. Um, that's not to try to make you sleep or you know, sleep less, but it is also to allow for us to reach additional corners of the world and members of the community um, and, and be as accommodating in terms of those time zones as possible. And so um, for today, we have, you know, we've tried to mirror that as much as possible in terms of keynotes, lightning talks. Will there also be another keynote tonight? We'll be joined by Melissa Handel um, from NIH Center for Data to Health, um, as well as we'll have, you know, double award ceremonies and things like that too. So if you were wondering why it looks like there's some repetition there, um, that's just baked in to be accommodating to our colleagues and in, in other time zones around the world. I think that that covers all of it. Vanessa, is there anything that I'm missing? No, I think that that, okay. that is everything. Okay. I just want to just say a big appreciation. I see also community members jumping in to help manage on Slack and other spaces. So thank you because my little cold fingers here in Boston cannot type fast enough. So all help appreciated. Thank you. <laughs> okay. So with that, um, I know I am, I've been waiting for this panel and or for these two opening keynotes rather um, for, for many weeks now. And so I uh, think I would love to be able to just even account for some additional time so that you maybe between the keynotes and lightning talks, we can give like a five minute break if folks need to like get up and go. So um, Vanessa, I know because we've got so many people on the chat, you are gonna pin the videos um, for myself, for Aviva and for Elaine. Give you a moment to do that. Zoom conference fun. Okay. Um, so I uh, want to take a moment just to say, you know, we were pulling together this program and thinking through all of the various, uh, you know, kind of means of kind of stretching our abilities to, you know, think through some of the challenges of this past year. Um, you know, the the two panelists or the two keynotes that we're going to be joined by uh, really, to me, um, embody, you know, folks who've been not only working to push change within the system and within higher education for a long time, they've been at the forefront of that um, as well and is pushing, you know, the, the need and demand for openness 
and matching it with dollars. So um, in terms of our opening um, opening keynote of canceling big deals and reinvesting in open, um, it is my distinct pleasure to welcome Elaine Westbrooks, uh, the university librarian and vice provost at the University of North Carolina, Chapel Hill, um, as well as Aviva Weinraum, who's a vice provost for university libraries at the University at Buffalo. Um, and in terms of uh, short introduction, they, and these two, you know, kind of titans in the space have, have quite a lot um, to go through, but I'll try to be quick. Um, Elaine has been the um, university librarian and vice provost at UNC Chapel Hill since August 2017. Um, she's responsible for the leadership and the general administration for the university libraries there. Uh, it's a network of nine libraries with approximately 300 librarians, archivists, and staff. Um, and from 2014 to 2017, um, she was the Associate University Librarian for Research at the University of Michigan. Um, she administrated the short and long-term objectives for library support, the research enterprise while she was there. She's also been the Associate Dean uh, of Library Operations from 2008 to 2012 uh, at the University of Nebraska Lincoln, where she was responsible for access services, um, public services, technical services, assessment data management services. From 2000 to 2008, she held a variety of positions at Cornell University Library, um, including metadata librarian, senior metadata librarian, head of metadata services, um, and she started her career as a Latin American uh, cataloger and digital research librarian at the University of Pittsburgh. Um, Elaine's also a member of the uh, Association for Research Libraries Advocacy and Public Policy Committee, the Executive Committee and Governing Board of the Triangle Research Libraries Network, and the University Libraries Advisory Council for the 17 campus University of North Carolina system. And I'm sure I'm leaving a more out um, from that side too. Um, Aviva, just to uh, introduce both at the same time here, um, Aviva recently joined in 2019 uh, the University at Buffalo uh, system. And I'm a proud upstate New Yorker, so this makes me happy. Uh, as a vice provost for university libraries, uh, Aviva has been and Elaine have both been national leaders in digital library initiatives, technology and innovation for quite some time. Um, Aviva joined University at Buffalo from Northwestern where she was the associate university librarian for collections and technologies. Um, and just to, to brag about both of them a little bit, um, she at that time she helped launch cross campus initiatives, um, hubs for undergrad academic support like the Academic Resource Center. Um, she also spearheaded work on textbook affordability and implementation of open educational resources in teaching and learning. Prior to Northwestern, she was the chief operating officer and service manager for the former Digital Preservation Network. And I know we've got a number of librarians in, uh, on, the, on the chat as well, uh, which was a federation with more than 60 institutions working towards long-term preservation of digital objects. Um, she's held positions at Oregon State University, Tufts University, Yale, it's been associated with the Avalon Project, Fedora Project. Um, she and I both have been on the DuraSpace and now Lyricist board together where she is uh, currently the board chair. Um, both welcome, welcome to JROS 2020. Thank you for helping us kick off this event. Um, I wanted to turn it over to you both and Elaine, we'll start, we'll start with you here um, to tell us a little bit more about, uh, you know, both of you have been through canceling big deals within your systems um, and I know have also been advocating for, you know, broader investment in open. Tell us a little bit more about what that's been like and, and what that work has kind of manifested into um, before this strange 2020 year, as well as uh, currently where we are now. Great. Well, thank you, Caitlin, for that um, introduction. I am super excited to be here. I'm a big fan of Caitlin and all the work she's been doing and the network and and um, and just greetings to everyone from a rainy, um, cool Chapel Hill. Um, but in order to uh, address Caitlin's um, question that she posed to myself and Aviva, just to give you some background, um, at the University of North Carolina at Chapel Hill, uh, we were basically presented with the option of renewing our um, big deal. And so we had a $2.6 million deal um, with Elsevier. And um, we started negotiations in 2018 and we just couldn't come to a, 
decision that I felt really comfortable with. So we extended the contract for a year. And I took that opportunity to do the work across campus that desperately needed to be done to um, basically convince people that one, we have a major problem on our hands. And two, we were gonna be a bold institution that was gonna do something about it. So um, in 2018, we started the work. And then of course, we all know in um, February of 2019, the University of California did the unthinkable and they walked away from Elsevier. And so that gave me a big shot in the arm. arm and we took that and we ran with it. So, um, after that happened, um, we essentially said, let's one, convince the students, faculty and staff that there's a major problem. Two, that we have not necessarily the solution, but we have some initiatives and processes that we want to in implement so that um, we can embark on a path of sustainable scholarship. And so, um, what we had was essentially a, a kind of like a crisis, right? <laughs> and so we took this crisis and said, one, we have a $2.6 million deal. It's not fair. It's not just, and we're going to break it. And then um, two, we, we probably don't have the money for, to continue with a $2.6 million deal. So we launched an initiative called Sustainable Scholarship, and we focused on four values, affordability, sustainability, transparency, and open. And so every time we spoke, we focused on these four things. And so we were very clear. And I have to say, I, I stole a lot from the University of California. <laughs> you know, they did some great work. And so I just copied it and actually tweaked it for a Carolina audience. And so with these um, four values, we went out and we, we educated our campus about what was important. And I think what I want people to know is that um, first, a lot of people don't understand the nature of scholarly communication. And, um, and so from my mind, the goal is open science. That's always been the goal. Um, but if you're going to get to open science and you're going to get to open infrastructure, you have to convince the faculty that there is a major problem in terms of equity, in terms of uh, research metrics, in terms of the infrastructure we're using, who owns the infrastructure, who controls it, peer review. I mean, it's just, I could just go on and on about the problems with our scholarly communication system and how inequitable it is. And so as we went down this process, we didn't break it till about March of this year. So the pandemic is starting up. We just broke the deal. And now we're in the middle of two pandemics, right? We have the COVID-19 and then we have a pandemic of racism, right? And so I fundamentally felt that the most compelling argument that our researchers and students would understand is the equity problem and how open is one of the things that we can aspire to embrace to create a more equitable system. And so we did a campus tour and we talked to administrators, I talked to boards, we talked to anybody who would listen, I would talk to about the problems. And, um, and so what we ended up doing was we had approximately 20,000 titles, I'm sorry, not 20,000, 2,000 titles in our Elsevier deal. We canceled 1,600 of them and we were left with 395. And, um, and we did that through a survey process where we listed all the titles, we sent it out to faculty and students, and then they helped us select the titles we also have been collecting a huge amount of data about the faculty, about where they publish. We also um, had all the usage statistics. And so we tried to triangulate a variety of data sets to pick the best titles. And I'm really happy to say that we've been looking at um, our interlibrary loan statistics just to understand, did we do a good job? And so we um, instituted something called Reprints Desk and Reprints Desk um, is a um, interlibrary loan option which bypasses the library technically, and you can get your article in two to four hours. And so um, we had basically set up this new system specifically to deal with this, um, the fact that we canceled 1600 titles. 
And I'm happy to report that since March, um, we have had about 60 uses of Reprints Desk. And about 11 of those have been from Elsevier, from the titles we canceled. So just think about that. So we, we saved a million dollars when we canceled 1,600 titles. And as a result, we have gotten 11 requests for those titles since March. So if you could do the math, that is probably a savings of about $850,000. Um, and it, what's interesting is the requests we got were for actually Taylor and Francis titles. And I, we're not sure what that's about, but we'll go back and look at that. And so the idea that you're gonna cancel titles and your interlibrary loan is gonna go through the roof is just not true. Um, like I said, we have 11 requests for those titles. We had even more requests for other titles. So, um, so I feel like we did good work, we made good choices, and we will continue to look at the data um, for, I don't know, forever. <laughs> and you also have to be vigilant because while you're working with your faculty, um, Elsevier is going to be constantly targeting your faculty and trying to get a deal on the side. They're gonna be trying to um, uh, convince your faculty that you know, the library is not doing things the right way. I mean, that's been my experience so, for, so far. So you have to be vigilant and you have to continue the conversation. And so once we canceled, you know, I, I could not take a victory lap. <laughs> you know, I could not take a nap. The work still continues. This work is never over. And as we continue thinking about a new world where the scholars have more control over their IP, they have more control of the process, we continue that conversation of the, the infrastructure that needs to be in place to support the work that needs to get done. And hopefully in the Q&A, we can talk more about that open infrastructure process and what we're using at Carolina, but I'll, I'll turn it over to Viva to um, share her experience at SUNY Buffalo. Thanks, Elaine. Um, so, uh, hi, everybody. Uh, I'm Aviva Weinreb Lejoie, she, her, hers. Um, and I am joining you today from the territory of the Seneca Nation, which is a member of the Haudenosaunee Six Nations Confederacy. Um, so, our experience was pretty similar to Elaine's. Just to give you a little bit of context, um, the SUNY system is a, a really diverse system. There are more than 60 institutions within SUNY. And they range from university centers, so those are full undergraduate PhD research granting institutions, including R1 institutions, uh, which is a research designation that we use in the US, um, and uh, encompasses also comprehensive colleges, technical and community colleges. We have about 32,500 faculty across the system and about 425,000 students across the system. So just to be clear though, um, when students apply, they are applying to a single institution, not to the system, but we are, this is the, the system collectively as we negotiated our deal. So our previous contract spend for Science Direct was over $9 million annually for the, uh, for the system. Um, and again, I, I want you to think very, like think about this a little bit. There are four university centers and most of the rest of the institutions within SUNY are not PhD granting institutions. So we're spending a lot of money for a relatively small portion of the research enterprise across the system. Our goal in our negotiation initially was a $1 million savings in our contract. Uh, and as Elaine mentioned, we are working really on the same timeline that UNC was. So our contract was renegotiated in March. That was when it went live of, of 2020. Um, but we also really benefited from the University of California systems walk away from their deal. That really provided our faculty with a lot of better understanding of what was going on in that publishing space. And seeing the University of California walk away allowed us to have some very different kinds of conversations with faculty across the system, but most specifically, I'll talk about our faculty at UB. So as Caitlin mentioned, I had just started in August of 2019 and basically walked into our negotiations. Um, I was asked to join the negotiations team. It was one of the first things I started to do. And I actually, when I came on board, started pushing pretty hard for us to rethink this deal. 
Um, again, we had just come out of out of the of uh, U, the UC system walking away from their deal. I felt like this was an opportunity. Um, some people refer to it as the tipping point, um, and I, I think it was an opportunity for us to really rethink how we could reallocate our resources differently into other areas that would support scholarship and research. So uh, some things that we did, uh, we created a coordinated communication plan across the system. Um, and Elaine mentioned that, that UC had done a ton of work and built a ton of resources around how to communicate out. And we, we also took a lot of those resources and modified them both for the university centers and the comprehensive colleges so that everybody had language that would best meet the needs of their, of, of really interacting with their faculty. We also had an internal agreement amongst all of the directors, and this actually goes to Elaine's point about the way that some of the publishers work in the space, um, to say nobody is going to have a side deal while we're negotiating here. Nobody is going to go outside of this, of this negotiation and negotiate something else. There were opportunities that came up, conversations that happened. There was some interest in kind of pushing along those lines. Um, but we we worked really hard on making sure that we were all going to be in the same place. We also made an agreement that we would not have uh, a one year extension, which is one of the other things that that um, some of the publishers ask you to do. They'll give you the same rates, the same terms while you spend another year figuring things out. Um, we felt like that was just not really in our best interest to do that. So um, we agreed uh, at a, um, a library, SUNY Library Consortium meeting in mid-October of 2019 that we were willing to walk away from that contract. From there, um, we then started working with our faculty senate, our SUNY faculty senate. So this is separate from the college faculty senates. And the SUNY faculty senate actually passed a continuing resolution for a fair and reasonable contract with Elsevier. Uh, that, uh, that is up online. I'm also happy to share a link. Um, and when I'm done talking, I'll share a link to that uh, for you um, so that you can see that resolution. We also did, uh, just like Elaine did, uh, town halls, email blasts, departmental meetings, faculty senate meetings, graduate and student sessions, liaison talking points, uh, each school within the SUNY system had a website with FAQs, um, and we were really actively meeting with our faculty in every way that we could so that we could educate them about what we were doing, why we were walking away, how we might be able to reallocate some of those resources into different areas to support their work, and why this was an important thing for us to do. So for the most part, with very, very, very little um, uh, negative pushback, our faculty were supportive of this. Um, the questions that they asked were primarily related to accreditation. Is this going to impact our ability to be accredited? Are we going to be able to have access to these resources if we need them for research purposes? And, and we did, right? Um, and we, we, we promised that we would be able to, and we've been able to do that. So. Um, I can talk a little bit about some of our negotiations, um, if you'd like me to, a little bit. So we really didn't start negotiating in earnest with them until October of 2019, and our contract end date was December of 2019, right? So we were supposed to extend, we were supposed to sign by then. Um, our requests for lower costs were rejected, um, uh, and we and eventually ended up with three packages put in front of us. Um, and we decided to basically uh, walk away from a package deal and to do a title by title uh, contract with them. And that was primarily based on a relationship that we ended up building with um, uh, Unpaywall. Uh, and we worked with them on their Unpaywall journals tool, which is now called Unsub. And we used that tool as the primary tool that we use to identify where what we were sort of calling the breaking point of our contracts, right? So uh, so we chose to basically choose journal titles where the cost for purchasing the title was basically what we would cost if we were going to uh, either the cost of or more than the cost, or sorry, let me rephrase this. I'm gonna try and articulate this appropriately. Um, we were trying to find the point at which it was a, no longer affordable for us to purchase the title by title, uh, 
uh, aspect of the journal title. Is that making sense? I'm sorry. I'm trying. I'm realizing that's not terribly clear. Thank you. Okay, good. Um, I, we can get clarification on that if you'd like. So um, what we did was we identified 250 core titles across all of our sectors across the system. We um, had those, uh, we, we reached out to all of our liaisons. Our liaisons spoke and worked with all of our departments. Um, we the, the title list modified a little bit from there, but we ended up with 248 titles that we ended up going live with. One of the journals folded during our negotiation time period, and the other negotiation, the other title went open access during that time. So um, that was basically what happened with us. Uh, so we ended up signing a three-year agreement, and with that came a guarantee of... Um, uh, a percentage off of your uh, APC costs for publishing in Elsevier journals. Um, we uh, they were really pushing with us on the APCs as being a. Uh, they were what did they originally offer us? Two hundred fifty thousand dollars off of our APCs for the entire system, um, which is not a lot of money when you're considering the sheer number of faculty that we have and the sheer number of. Uh, of articles that we publish in Elsevier journals. So we were able to negotiate um, a, a slightly different contract. So uh, our APCs are a 10% discount across APCs for gold open access articles uh, published by SUNY corresponding authors. So that should give you a, a pretty good idea of kind of what, what it took for us to get here. Um, in terms of our uh, what we've seen since March when everything got shut off, and to Elaine's point, you know the world that we're in is a little bit different than normal. We are averaging 81 ILL requests per month. Um, that is a little bit higher than last year, but again, that is not surprising to us. And it was certainly something that we had planned and expected with, uh, with walking away from this deal. Now, the one thing for you to maybe keep in mind here is that those 81 ILL requests that have been made that are being made per month are only for current titles. So we have back file access for everything purchased for everything published from uh, December 31st, 2019 back. So those are just moving forward. And yes, those numbers will increase over time. Um, but this also gives us a better idea of we can use this data to help us figure out whether or not we need to bring other journals back online or not. But currently we're not seeing our usage numbers hit anywhere to the point where we would need to resubscribe to uh, any of the titles that we canceled. Thank you so much. Was just um, taking a note of some of the questions that were coming in through the chat. Um, I think one of the first things I would love to lead with before again and getting into more of the um, chat, the questions that I know we had discussed prior to this, as well as um, some of the points and reacting to the remarks that you've already made. Uh, I know the title of this is canceling big deals and reinvesting in open. I'd love to hear about what that looks like because I know that you both have you both have thoughts for sure. Elaine, do you want to kick off? Sure. Um, I would say the um, biggest thing that we've had to do is to reevaluate what we do as a, as a library system. And so we had to look at our digital preservation strategy, our infrastructure, um, and, and really get a handle on our strategy. And I think this took a lot longer than I thought it would. Um, but of course, we have a... Um, Institutional repository. It's based on you know open um, source, and and um, and we are committed to maintaining that repository, um, given that we have theses and dissertations. But we're also looking at how can we um, create, how can that infrastructure be more useful, seamless um, for our faculty, students, and staff. Um, so we we're doing a lot more work with. Um, with that, and, and we, we actually published a read and publish deal with SAGE, and um, we're working with SAGE on how to, for example, automatically deposit the open access articles in our institutional repository. So I would say we're not as far as I thought we would be. Um, the other thing that we have to look at is our memberships and what organizations we want to support to articulate our values. Um, another thing, um, I want to mention about values is that as we negotiate with 
with com- with um, publishers and vendors, we actually put them the task on open infrastructure. And we're willing to say, if you don't, um, if you are a company that that is just about proprietary stuff and you don't want to open up things, like we don't want to work with you. And so I don't, I, you know, some people might be disappointed that we're not saying, oh, we're doing, you know, we, we have this thing figured. We don't have it figured out at all, but there are certain steps that we have to take and I think this is a long journey for us and that, you know, you can ask me this question about three years and I, get, I hope to have a much firm response um, because it really is a shift for our organization to rethink everything we do, how we do it. And, and we have to plan. You got to have a plan and a roadmap in place if you're going to be successful. Yeah, I, I will say, I think... Um... So we have a, there are a couple of things that I think are a little bit different at UB and SUNY more generally. Uh, We have not done as much investment in open infrastructure as uh, other institutions have. So we also have an institutional repository. It is running on an older version of DSpace. We are working on um, funding for a research data repository uh, that is primarily the conversation has been around medical data and health science data. Um, which uh, I think if if you sort of look at at the communities, it makes a certain sense, certainly on our campus it does. Um, But we are planning on basically using the investment in the infrastructure building around a research data repository to be able to help with some of the other areas that we're not, we're also not supporting like humanities research, which is one of the other areas that I think kind of gets the short shrift when it comes to this kind of infrastructure conversation. But, you know, so UB saw a a pretty significant savings from our renegotiated deal. We saved um, somewhere in the vicinity of about six and a half million dollars on that deal. Um, And so that money does get to be reinvested into the campus and into our work differently. This year um, has not been the best year for obvious reasons. Um, You know, we, we basically realized those savings and then immediately those savings were swept up in all of the budget um, issues that we've all been experiencing across the board. So it's it's sort of hard to say how we're going to, how we are currently reinvesting it, but our planning work on reinvesting that money is really around building the infrastructure that we can to support the preservation and the, the, the retention of our faculty research data and the faculty research resources. Um, we are we are also not expecting that we're going to continue seeing um, that we're going to be able to start negotiating some of these other deals down as well, and we might be able to see other savings that we can realize differently. Um, there have been conversations about how we might be able to reinvest this money across the system, but again, our system is very complex and very different, um, and so a research data repository doesn't have the same sort of um, impact for a community college as it does for an R1 or one of our research uh, university centers. So that's always a balancing act for us when we think about collective money as opposed to individual university money. Um, But I think Elaine's point about the strategic planning is really valuable here because we have to be thinking very carefully about what those steps are that help us shift from one way of doing our work to another. And there are also, I, I, I think this needs to be stated explicitly, Um, university budgets are complicated and how we can spend our money and on what things are very different. So, you know, at at, at UB, we get money for um, from student fees that we can use to pay for online resources, but we can't use for other things. Um, And so we always have to be very careful about how we're investing because sometimes it is about where that where that pot of money can be used and for what purposes which is really important for us when we start talking to campus leadership about how we are investing in these resources. Yeah, thank you for that. I know we've got a, a number of really, really great questions here, but Elaine, I wanted to pick up on your, your point, and, and I know there's been a lot of discussion, at least in a lot of the dialogues I've been in around the open infrastructure community, as well as higher ed about realigning or at least using the values to kind of, you know, drive some decision making. Um, and one of the questions in the chat um, from Chris Holdgraf was, you know, who gets to define open and what that means at your institution? And have you run into competing visions and and how does that affect when it comes to making these sort of budgetary decisions or choices about technology? 
That's a great question. I mean, I, I actually feel like the library is really well positioned. And I think in many ways, um, we're driving that definition. So for example, we're planning a new data science school. And I am desperately pushing for this school to start with a value of open infrastructure, open access, open everything open, that if we could start it off that way, and let's start thinking about um, the data that we're going to need, the data, how we're going to curate it, preserve it, where is it going to sit? Um, because of course, we're talking about data science, we're talking about large um, sets, and we're talking about a program that is going to impact the entire campus. And the idea that every student that goes to the University of North Carolina, Chapel Hill, will graduate with a certain kind of um, data literacy that will make them successful um, citizens as they go out into the world. So, um, so I think that we really want to transform the entire campus. And so part of that discussion of open infrastructure happens with the Office of Research, it happens with the medical school, and we're looking at our um, health programs, which are pretty big, you know, public health, pharmacy, nursing, and trying to work with them on infrastructure and getting them to think very differently about what infrastructure is and how they use it. Um, the challenge we have is we have these vendors that are very good at their jobs and they're constantly bombarding our faculty with these turnkey solutions, these silver bullets that are just going to save their lives. <laughs> and they're often um, just not well informed as to the options that they have. And so I, I do not think, I'm not crazy enough to believe that there's going to be one infrastructure at Carolina or that faculty are going to all get up and, and just say, hey, you know, we, we want everything to be open <laughs> because there's just, I think people need to understand that the awareness gap is significant and we have to continue. And that's why I'm very focused on graduate students because they're the future of, they're going to be the future academics and getting them to understand how they make decisions and also think about privacy and to think about what they use and how when they use these free systems that they're the data and that they are um, giving up their privacy. Like there's all these other, it's just so complicated. So I would say the library is driving that definition, but there's still a lot of um, misinformation. There's a lot of unawareness and, um, and we're very much committed to um, trying to just help people be a little more informed than they were before. Uh, yeah, I mean, I would say that for us, it is also to some extent the library that is helping to to define what we're talking about when we say even when we say open. Um, but I I think this is a, a a regular and constant conversation, and I think it's a conversation that we're having even with an IOI, right? You know, when we talk about what is open infrastructure, what is open access, what do these mean? How do they intersect? How do they work together? How do they not work together? Um, those are complicated conversations. And I think sometimes when the differing visions about things are often because people are actually coming at it from a slightly different perspective. Um, and so a lot of it to Elaine's point is around these kind of regular conversations and regularly meeting to talk about what are those intersection points and how we can make that work better. Um, in terms of, you know, differing internal visions and opinions, again, you know, I, I, I think a lot of that is about, you know, how, how we talk about these things and that there are many faces to this, like, I'll use the Janus face, right? Like it's, there are, are multiple ways of even looking at this that are all valid that come into this conversation, right? This is not an easy topic. How many conferences have we all been to about this, right? We know this, right? So um, I think that, um, that that is always going to be a complicated um, balancing act for us, but but I do believe to, that we are actually leading a lot of that conversation. Um, but we also, I think, really have to think very carefully about the language that we're using around that because people get their hackles up about some of these things in a way that is um, that makes that makes it hard to have the conversation. 
I, it, that kind of segues into a couple of questions. And for those who are asking questions in the chat, I'm working to cluster these as best I can because there's a lot of different topics that are here and it's keep them coming. Um, so we had a couple questions around, um, you know, kind of shifts in behavior and shifts in culture. And to go back up to a question that um, Jenny Halpern asked at the beginning um, here about the NDA culture. And I know also Aviva, you'd mentioned Unsub, and we've got Heather and possibly Jason on the call with us today. And um, if you could talk a little bit more about not only that sort of NDA culture of not sharing or, um, you know, the costs associated and the use of open infrastructure and JROS community members like Unsub in helping to, you know, fuel some of that decision making or pow power that decision making in different ways. Um, I'd love to know some of your perspectives. I can start by saying um, we have declared very publicly that we will never sign another non-disclosure agreement again. Um, and the agreement we, we signed with Elsevier, I, I'd be happy to share it with everyone. Um, and so that's the first thing. Um, I would say, um, and also shout out to Unsub, we did use Unsub as we um, to gather data and to understand our faculty more. Um, but I think when you think about the behavior and culture, it, it is a it's an extreme challenge for us because, of course, all the disciplines are very different, and humanists are behaving a certain way um, than the physical sciences, than the medical sciences, and so um, so I feel like this is the heavy lifting that we're working on. Um, I think the challenge we have is, for example, I don't know, um, I don't have a full accurate account of how much, how much our faculty are paying in terms of APCs. I have tried, I've worked with procurement, the research office. I just don't have the most accurate information and we're trying to get there, but that's just a perfect example. Um, I don't know exactly when a researcher decides that they're gonna pay $40 and click on the article from the website. I don't know how many fa faculty are using Sci-Hub. So there's just a lot of um, workarounds that faculty and scholars are, are using that are completely unseen. And so that's something that we're committed to doing is digging in and talking to people. And so the next step for us is we're gonna interview a group of faculty and try to understand um, their information seeking behaviors, um, particularly around Elsevier content. What are they doing now that they don't have access? What are their strategy? Like there's a lot of stuff going on there because if you only depend on use of statistics, you are not getting the full picture. Um, and I think the final thing I'll say is one of the most important things we've been able to do is really just demonstrate the costs. A lot of our researchers have no idea the cost of this research and, and when we explain the profit margins and how much we're spending at $2.6 million, I mean, that's, we have about, we spend about 20 million on, on content. And when 2.6 of that is going to one publisher, and actually that's not the full cost. Cause we also, we also, we basically were giving Elsevier about 3.3 million when you include clinical key, ebook packages, GeoBase, all those other ones, um, in addition to Science Direct. So, making sure those costs are transparent was also part of our um, process. So New York State has um, a, uh, uh, we call FOIL, which is um, your ability to effectively request from us the Freedom of Information Law. You're able to request from us uh, any contract information that you want, which means that we cannot sign an NDA agreement. Um, which I think is great uh, because it does make the, make it so that anybody can take a look at the contracts that we sign, so that we we don't get into this situation again where um, you know Elaine has one price and I have a different price and we're effectively the exact same kind of institution um, with the exact same number of faculty with the exact same research profile. Um, we're we are not obviously, but but it, you know in this sort of case where there's been no way for us to tell what we're paying or or how much or to what end. Um, an example that, I, that I've been giving when I talk about our deal with SUNY is actually connected to the City University of New York, which also had a science direct contract. They were paying $3 million less than we were. Why? 
there was no real reason, right? We couldn't figure out why they were paying such a significantly different amount other than their research profile was different than ours. Um, and so when we started having some of our conversations with our faculty, educating them about these pricing structures, telling them that, you know, we, when I started actually, I'll tell you, I had a conversation with, um, with a group of faculty um, when they saw that three of their journals were on the block and they were saying, but these are our journals and we have to publish here and we request this. And when we were able to actually show them their usage data, to actually show them how often they were accessing this journal as a, as a group, right? How many articles they had downloaded um, and then the actual cost of the journal. Right. When, first of all, most of them had no idea how much the journal actually cost. Right. But then when they started seeing those costs laid out for them, it really changed the conversation pretty quickly. And instead of the conversation being, why can't you give this to me now? The conversation became, how do we talk? How do we work on flipping this model so it doesn't so that it's not costing us like this? Right. And those kinds of conversations, I think, are invaluable, whether or not we are able to flip all of them, whether or not they should all flip is a completely different story. But the fact that that became the first line of conversation was this is broken. How do we fix it? Um, and I really appreciated that that's where that went to. Elaine also mentioned the the sort of hidden costs that are associated here. Right. So we don't know who's paying APCs. We don't necessarily know how much they're paying. We don't know. Um, you know, and, and we're trying to find this. Um, I ran a research project um, a couple of months ago with um, our head of institutional research at, at UB, and um, we decided that we were just going to focus on political science faculty. We were just going to try and get a handle on what it would cost for us to include in a startup package the actual cost of paying those APC charges. So if in your startup package, we can give you $20,000 for to pay for APCs, would that work for you? Does that make sense for your profession? We still couldn't really get that data figured out in a way that made any sense. And so it becomes hard for us to think about how we're going to move forward and how we can flip this differently if we can't actually pull the right kind of information to make that happen. Oh, thank you for that. Um, trying to get through some of these additional questions here as well. And I think um, the points that you've just touched on in terms of, I know we've had a couple of questions around this of tracking the investment for open infrastructure, tracking the number of, you know, um, publishing venues. And I know that there's a number of research intelligence services for those that, that is a new term, um, essentially the, the data about all of this work, um, both, you know, groups like Unsub uh, that are doing this, you know, from an open perspective, but also a lot of commercial offerings in that space too, um, that the data, I mean, we exist because that information is not readily accessible <laughs> to help um, shed some light on that too. So I know that there have been a number of questions about things that we can do to better um, uh, elucidate what those costs are. And thank you for, for speaking to some of that too. Um, in terms of the, I know you've spoken to the decisions and you know looking at the usage, usage statistics and the conversations that you're having with faculty and researchers around access to some of the titles. Have you seen any change in faculty publishing choices as a result of this? Are they choosing open access options or are those also part of some of those discussions going into the new year? Well, that's a tough question. Um, I have to say, I, I just don't know, um, but I can say that I'm getting a lot more questions, broader questions about faculty who are trying to run a journal in their department and they're just really struggling, you know, or faculty who are on the publishing committee of their society and they have the choice of whether to continue um, working with Wiley. And so I'm happy that I've been able to talk to the faculty to give them more information about making a better decision. And so there was one journal on education and they were going to go up to a $3,600 APC. And and the faculty member was just like this. Yeah, this makes sense. And I was just like, wait a minute, <laughs> that's like this is the social sciences. Like, do you, how many people are going to be able to afford a three thousand six hundred dollar APC? You know, I was able to walk her through all the ideas that they had and the consequences of each decision they were going to make. 
And ultimately, they rejected that, I think it was $800 increase in the APCs. Um, I also um, told them that they could potentially be um, making decisions that are going to force me to cancel that title, right? And so if I'm going to cancel, I can imagine many other institutions canceling. So, you know, this idea that, um, that our faculty are part of these societies that make decisions all the time and they have no idea of the consequences. And so the society is one of the things that I've really been looking at recently and talking directly with faculty about the societies they belong to and the decisions they make because the society publications are typically high quality but they are jumping in bed with these publishers and making really bad decisions that are not in their best interests. And so the society work, the association work is really, really important because we got those big five publishers, but we also have those societies which are increasingly jumping into um, negotiations with the publishers because the publishers promise them all this money, scholarships, all these things that they're giving them in return for, for moving their journal to um, uh, Springer or Wiley. Wiley and Springer are the two big ones. So, so I would say those are the types of questions I'm getting more, but it's hard to, to understand how faculty are responding because it's just, I mean, there's so many of them and they are very different across the disciplines. I say just to quickly hop in on that before Aviva, I would love your comments as well because I can imagine this applies to both of you. So Elaine, you just beautifully went into the, you know, talking through the consequences and, and tying that to, you know, the fact that this may cause you to, the cause of the library to have to cancel another sort of subscription. But I can imagine that Elaine does not scale across the broader campus. So like how, and this is a question for both of you, how do we start having this dialogue in a way that feels, you know, more, I don't know, present, permanent, um, thinking about how those one-on-one -on -one conversations, as important as they are, um, are also really difficult. And I can imagine you got a lot of other things competing for your time. Aviva, why don't you go first? Okay. Well, I, I was actually just going to say that, um, well, to sort of finish the first one, Elaine really touched on all of it, right? There's nothing that I really think that I needed to add there. Um, the... Um, in terms of you know what we can do moving forward, this is a that's a tough question. I mean, it's a really tough question, and I think um, this is where I say I am not um, I am not a publicity person, um, and I am not a marketing person, and that is not where my expertise lies. And if I'm being honest, I feel like we might actually benefit from having somebody who does nonprofit marketing work help us figure out how to have a different kind of conversation because. Um, because you're right, right? Like, uh, you know, I can go and talk to the faculty senate, but that doesn't mean anything. It doesn't mean that it trickles down anywhere. It doesn't mean that that conversation finishes or completes, right? I can keep holding sessions, but, you know, honestly, it's usually the same five faculty who come, um, depending upon which location I'm doing it in, because those are people that are already passionate about this work. And so I think the the issue isn't so much about how do we expand it? It's how do we get more people passionate? And, you know, Elaine mentioned this before, right? But her focus on graduate students as the future academics, uh, I think is really the way that that conversation has to go. I mean, and I'm also going to say flat out, the other piece of this is, um, is just the tenure issue, right? Is, um, and that's the, you know, the elephant in the room that, um, you know, I, every faculty member thinks it's the administration and the administration thinks it's the, the departments. And, you know, if we want this to change that needs to happen, those conversations need to happen there. Um, and, and there are other issues with tenure that we don't need to get into, but I think that's part of it. Thank you for that. Um, we did have a question about the role of funders in this. So I would love to hear your thoughts on as well and what dimensions that may take in the work that you do. I mean, funders are tremendously influential. And if, if we just recall when the NIH <laughs> made their policy move and, and um, basically forced people to put their content into PubMed, I mean, to me, if, if our funders could, um, you know, I dare say, force our researchers to use certain standards, I think that would help tremendously. <laughs> Um, and 
it's, I realize that there, you know, standards are great, but there's so many of them, right? Um, but for us, the, the metadata that we need to track research productivity, metrics, all those things that we're collecting is really difficult without ORCIDs and DOIs and, and certain standards. So I would love for NSF and IMLS and all these other ones to um, be more forceful and just say, you know, I know it's kind of like a, you know, you like to use the, the carrot versus the stick, but I feel like you need sticks because at the end of the day, you know, even when the NIH put that standard down, people were crying how this was the end of the world and they didn't do it and it wasn't going to be successful. They don't have time. And look what happened. I mean, that's just not true. And the publishers are always going to fight back on those types of things. So, you know, push the standards. And if you do it by, if you just encourage people, it's never going to happen. You have to, you have to mandate it. Aviva, was there anything you wanted to add to that? No, just that I, I was, it, it may, it makes me think just sort of the, this conversation around standards and using those standards and making sure that the infrastructure that we're building or that we're purchasing supports those standards. And that, um, so uh, Kaylin and I have been working on some work around open standards for our software to basically make it so that you are that you will know that you can easily transport your data from system to system, that the systems themselves will talk to each other, that your data can be findable and usable across these systems. And, and I think that kind of stuff is really important, as certainly when we talk about even how we build our infrastructure, right? We need to be building our infrastructure from the ground up with the idea that it should interoperate with other technologies. That it, that, and that is, I think, all about going back to that earlier question about kind of who defines what open is, right? This is around us actually defining that opens, that openness in multiple aspects of our work. No, thank you for that. Um, I know we are coming up to the end of our time um, and I wanted to make sure that we had some time for this. Um, Elaine, you touched on in your, your opening remarks, not only the you know, economic volatility and the global pandemic, but the pandemic of racism and how equity um, helped as a, a, an additional driver for the work that you were doing on this side. And I know that this is something that's permeated the work uh, across the board, um, not only for institutions in the US, but more broadly, it was the recent theme of the open access week uh, for the third year running around open for whom, um, and would love to hear remarks um, from from both of you, especially about, you know, what, what work lies ahead? What does this look like going into 2021 for you, um, given where we are as well? Yeah, I, I feel like um, we all need to go through a reckoning process. And we have certainly done that in my organization and thinking about how deeply inequitable the system is and how it's very much centered on whiteness. And we have to get away from that. And, and oftentimes it's, you know, it's global South or, you know, like we use these very vague terms to describe those who have and those who have not. And, um, you know, a lot of these publishers and vendors are, um, are not diverse. The boards are not diverse. And so I think we have a, a very big problem, actually. And I think that um, one thing we're going to do at Carolina is, you know, I'm putting my vendors to task. And if you're a vendor and you're putting on panels and they're all white people or all men, or not, like I, I'm like, I don't want to work with you. I don't want to work with you. If your boards are not diverse, I don't want to work with you. And and so, you know, I have, I have an ongoing conversation with one vendor and, and I'm just pointing these things out. And, and, and I think a lot of these companies, they're just performing. They're not really trying to do meaningful change. They're not trying to dismantle their systems. They are maintaining a status quo that is deeply inequitable and um, not diverse. So I just feel like um, as a customer, we have to push everyone to think about equity. And, and that includes our researchers as well. Um, you know, you look at these editorial boards and they're all men or all white and, you know, like they are part of the system. And so they want they want an open world, but they don't want to change their behaviors and they don't want to point out the fact that why or ask the question, why is this board all white? So 
So I think there's just so much work to do with regard to the campus, individual researchers, us as customers. And, um, and I think that um, there's, there needs to be um, a deeper reckoning within the publishing industry, within um, all of these different parts. And I think the infrastructure, who, who owns it, who has access to it, who gets to create it, that is something that um, I'm also thinking about. And I, and I know your organization is also thinking about that too. So, so we have a long, long way to go, but I'm grateful that we have this opportunity right now to do something. I would plus one that. I, I guess the, the other thing I, I keep thinking about, um, and I, I'm not really sure how to articulate this in a particularly productive way, but there was an article a couple of years ago um, published by a presenter at IFLA um, at their meeting in um, Kuala Lumpur. Um, and it was a, an African scholar who researched the idea of, of basically open amongst the librarians. I believe it was um, a subset of academic librarians in Nigeria. And what I found really interesting about it was that the group said that holistically they embraced the idea of open. And then when they actually walked into the, what the definition was for them and how that played out in the real world for them, uh, things changed pretty significantly. And I think that, yes, thank you. Uh, IFLA is the International Federation of Library Associations. I apologize, thank you. Um, uh, I, I think that that these conversations around who gets their voice at the table, how we define these things, who is who is really pushing um, where we're going, and how we make sure that those voices are represented at these tables are invaluable for us as we create as we create what this is. Right, we are still at the early stages of what this is and what this will be. Um, and we have an opportunity as we build this to think very differently about how, thank you, uh, that's probably at least I'm going to assume that it is, um, uh, that, uh, that, that I think it's, it's really important for us when we, to think about how we can include those voices into this conversation. Um, and, you know, I think certainly as a white Westerner, it is really easy to fall back on the networks of people that I know and the networks of researchers that I'm familiar with. And this is our opportunity to really think very differently about how we can bring those voices into this conversation. Um, but I, I, I will remind us that we are, we are all learning and we should all be pushing this really hard because inclusivity and, and having those voices at the table and not centering everything on northern western perspectives i think is is going to serve all of us in the long run well said and elaine the language that you used at the beginning of being vigilant um, across so many different dimensions of this work to me kind of really encapsulate encapsulates that um, looking just to see if there's any additional elements here i know we've got a ton of different questions and i've been trying to keep keep on top of them, but I know we are also towards the end. Um, if you had any sort of closing remarks as we go into the rest of JROST, knowing that we've got a, a rich two and a half days uh, left, what what either gives you hope going forward, you know, what work, any sort of lasting remarks that you'd, you'd like to bestow upon us? I would say you just have to, you can't give up. And we have a tremendous challenge ahead of us. And it can be very daunting to think about the deep inequities in the system and the, and the um, you know, the privilege that we have and, and how do we use it for, to be a, a voice of good. Um, and I would just say, you, you have to continue to do your homework and understand the systems that are at play. And so I'm constantly trying to understand um, the systems and how they work and who who has power and who does it because ultimately it comes down to power. And as a person who's at a elite privileged institution, what is it that I can do to make a greater um, world for the greater good? And I think that um, it just takes time and you have to be very humble 
to be able to make mistakes, but to, for people to also tell you that you're not doing things the right way. <laughs> so, so I just feel like in, in, the, in the midst of a pandemic, we have to have grace, we have to be flexible, we have to be adaptable, but we also need to be accountable. And to say, if we're going to reckon with um, elitist system, which it is, then you, you have to do the work you have to make mistakes and you have to take your licks because I, I know I've made mistakes, but to continue down this path of, of solidifying inequity is not good enough. And that's not the legacy I wanna have. So I am extremely grateful for organizations like yours, Caitlin and Spark and for um, companies like, you know, like the work that Unsub is doing. I mean, there's so many good actors in the process and if we could commit to working at every level, that would be the best that we can do right now. And we and we hold ourselves accountable and not get mad when someone calls us on on things when we fall down. Plus one, Elaine. Um, I, I will also say that I think um, we all need to maybe be comfortable with the small wins over and over small wins, little, like little wins are, are what will, what is it? The um, I'm, I'm looking to win all the battles, which will then let me win the war. Um, I, I don't really like military sort of things. That was not the best, um, but you get where I'm coming from. Um, look, I, I think to Elaine's point, this is exhausting work, right? This is entire careers move a needle just a little bit, but it is important work that we're all a part of. And, it's really important that we don't lose sight of what what the ultimate goal of what we're trying to get to is. Um, it is really easy to fight and nitpick over it's not perfect. Um, it's not perfect, right? We all know it's not perfect. Um, what is perfect, right? So let's let's work on trying to get to better um, and keep making better even better and even more inclusive and even just more thoughtful about whose voices are are we are centering in those conversations. Um, and so I, I just encourage all of us to keep up the good fight. And uh, and the pandemic will end, but this work will not. Well said, well said. Well, my sincere thanks for you both, not only joining us to help us kick off um, this event. Um, I hope you're able to stick around. We've got lots of good stuff coming up over the next few days. Um, and I will work to kind of go through the chat, make sure that any of those additional questions we, we kind of take to Slack. Um, we have coming up in three minutes, our first round of lightning talks which you won't want to miss. I'm going to do some dancing. Um, and uh, again, I just want to say uh, to Aviva and to Elaine, huge thanks for the, you know, for sharing your experiences with us, for the work that you all do, the work that you're committing to, and for helping us set a, a tone for the next few days. So please join me in sending your virtual applause to, um, to Aviva and Elaine. And for those who are sticking around for the first round of lightning talks, we will start that sharp in two minutes. So if you want to face mute and go grab a snack, this is your time.